everyone. Okay, uh, so let me just briefly remind you what we've been up to. Uh, we're talking about whispering gallery resonators and um, Specifically, last time we talked about micro disks and micro rings, and we'll wrap up that discussion uh, quickly today and then move on to microspheres and micro toroids, which are also whispering gallery resonators but with ultra high Q factors. So, just a brief reminder of what we discussed last time and uh, during last week. Uh, we used whispering gallery mode approximation and effective index approximation to find the solution for electromagnetic field inside of the disk for whispering gallery modes. Uh, this is for T-like modes, uh, distribution of electromagnetic field at the central plane of the disk, where you only have T polarization, magnetic field along the axis of the disk, and also electric field in plane. So for magnetic field for T, E, M, N mode, where M and N are azimuthal and radial numbers of the mode, you have this field distribution, uh, where J, M is the Bessel function of the mth order, E to the I and phi gives you the angular distribution, and is again the azimuthal number, uh, which gives you a number of nodes, uh, anti-nodes along the edge of the disk. And then radial number n uh, gives you the number of zeros that you have in the radial direction. And for each frequency, there are two degenerate modes that go clockwise and counterclockwise. Um, and then we use that to plot, in this particular case, the E16-1 mode. Uh, this is magnetic field distribution, electric field distribution you can obtain from Maxwell's equations and also from boundary conditions, um, setting up zero at the edge of the disk to be equal to zero, and uh, looking into the zeros of Bessel function, you can find the relation between dimensions of the disk, uh, such as radius of the disk, and valent, right? And that allows you to design disk to operate in a, in a certain mode uh, at a particular uh, valent. We also looked into uh, upper limit on the Q factor. Uh, this expression that we derived last time gives you the upper limit because it only takes into account loss in the radial direction coming from imperfect confinement by total internal reflection. Um, and we looked at this limit for the mode that we analyzed previously, for example, for TE16-1 mode, it's 200,000. Uh, this Q factor would increase if you increase the azimuthal number, uh, M, because this SMN, zero, of the Bessel function would increase. Um, but again, keep in mind that this is just the upper limit and doesn't give you the total loss because it doesn't give you loss in the vertical direction or any absorption loss or any scattering and so on. And uh, we wrapped up uh, the lecture last time by kind of briefly introducing ring resonators, which uh, people um, use uh, a lot because you can actually, um, you can obtain larger free spectral range. Uh, you remove the central part. So you technically only have modes uh, that correspond to the radial number n equal to one. Um, you can use pretty much the same expressions that we derived for micro disks in order to find modes of the micro ring. So this would be mode with certain azimuthal number m and n equal to one. Uh, and in this case, um, this ring is used to um, produce channel, so-called channel drop filter, right? So what people do here is uh, cascade a range, or, uh, an array of these rings with different diameters. Each one of them would resonate at a particular wavelength. And then if you have a set of different wavelengths coming from the input port, they would be dropped to different output ports through these rings of different diameters. So if this one resonates at particular wavelength lambda one, that wavelength would be dropped to this output port. Then you design another ring uh, with a larger diameter or a smaller diameter that operates at a different wavelength, lambda two. So that other wavelength would be dropped into a different port and so on. And that's called wavelength division demultiplexing, opposite function where you combine wavelengths from different uh, output ports, basically, if you run it in reverse uh, and run it all, combine it into the single uh, input waveguide, would be called uh, channel add filters. Uh, so those are all wavelength multiplexing, uh, multiplexing devices that are used in optical communications uh, because in optical communications, typically you will use different wavelengths to communicate to different end users. So you need a way to filter out that, those channels. And these uh, ring resonator geometries are often used for optical communications or optical interconnects in computer systems and so on. They provide you very easy filtering function. 
Um, and another application where they're used a lot is uh, modulator, uh, ring resonator based modulators. Um, I mean, if you if you're building an integrated silicon photonic circuit, you, you would, could also order to have some ring resonator modulators um, made uh, for you. Uh, and the way these modulators work is simply by changing the refractive index of the resonator uh, by some process. I mean, in, uh, typically people use free carrier injection but you can also use some other processes. Um, and in this case, for example, free carrier injection is used, uh, injection of carriers into silicon ring is used to change its refractive index um, that injected carriers would blue shift the resonance because they would reduce the refractive index of the ring. And what happens in that case is that uh, the resonance itself shifts towards the long, shorter valence, right? Because of the, the reduction in the refractive index. But there is also a change in the resonance in this, this case. And you see that it broadens as it's shifting towards lower, uh, low, shorter valence. And the broadening comes from the fact that you're injecting free carriers. So you have free carrier plasma. You're generating basically uh, reducing a um, uh, real part of the refractive index. But you're also introducing imaginary part, which introduces losses. And uh, the more carriers you inject, the more shift you have, but also the more broadening you have. And uh, that's. Um, in this particular case, not a big problem uh, because uh, you're using the system as a modulator. Uh, so if you park your input wavelength uh, at, for example, the, this resonance, and this is measured transmission through this input waveguide, uh, yeah, in normal steady state without any free carrier injection, that would not be transmitted to the output because that particular wavelength, uh, around 15, 15 nanometers, would resonate with this ring and get re-radiated somewhere outside. And it may be output port or simply re-radiates into free space. Uh, so that wavelength would not be transmitted. But then if you inject free carriers, you would blue shift the resonance uh, and then at the probe wavelength, at the input laser wavelength, suddenly you have high transmission, right? So your, your transmission uh, is shifted to the left and at the laser wavelength, you have blue or red curve, which means you have strong transmission. So you are not really on resonance with the ring anymore and instead you transmit to the output. Uh, so if you inject free carriers, let them relax, then transmission would go back to the original position. Uh, then you inject free carriers again, you can modulate basically transmission between maximum and minimum. Um, and this is how this uh, modulator operates. Uh, and the problem here is that you're using silicon where decay of recombination of carriers takes uh, a while because it's a uh, indirect band gap semiconductor. So your modulator would not normally operate very fast, but then people do something like sweeping of those generated free carriers with some pin junction in order to speed up the system. So that it operates stronger with a larger speed than megahertz, right? Um, and people have demonstrated gigahertz operation in this system by using sweeping of free carriers. Um, the other important point here is that you're producing a modulation. I mean, modulation is used essentially to convert electrical to optical signal at the output, right? So if you are uh, bring some electrical signal to these electrodes and you um, modulate free carrier injection using that electrical signal, that would also modulate um, in the same way the transmission, optical transmission in the system, and it would imprint the electrical signal modulation onto the transmitted laser beam. Right. So you are essentially converting the bit sequence in electrical domain uh, into a, a same signal in the optical domain, assuming you are not operating above the speed limit of the, of the system. So you would use this for applications such as you know, optical interconnects, for example, where you would connect some um, electrical components inside of the computer or different computers in a data center with optical connections. Right? because you have to convert electrical to optical signal and also at the output end optical to electrical signal, which you would do using some photo detectors. But this is the input end. And of course, in those applications, I mean, you wouldn't bother converting uh, electrical to optical signals unless you wanted to reduce energy consumption. So you want to make sure that your system doesn't consume a lot of energy for this conversion. Um, and the way to reduce the energy, uh, what we call energy per bit uh, for a particular frequency is uh, um, kind of in some way obvious here from this picture. Um, if you have a um, higher Q factor, you would have to shift this by less, right? In order to change transmission dramatically. 
But the problem with going to very high Q factors is that you would reduce the speed of operation on your system because Q factor determines photon storage time and photon storage time inside of the resonator gives you the limit on how long this photon coupled here has to recirculate before it's out coupled outside, right? So that would kind of limit how fast you can modulate the signal. Um, so you don't really want to increase the Q factor to infinity or something very large because it would slow down your modulator. So you want a trade-off between how fast you can operate and that should be uh, tens of gigahertz at least for, for modern system. And also you want to reduce energy consumption um, below picojoule per bit, uh, preferably uh, femtojoule per bit range so that you operate at much lower energy consumption than what you would do with electronic systems, right? By just transmitting electrical signals down the wires. Um, so just increasing Q factor would not work. You, you should still increase it to certain limit. I mean, this 40,000 would be fine because that would be tens of gigahertz, but not much higher than that. Uh, but then there are other options. I mean, another option for re reducing the energy consumption would be to reduce volume of the resonator. Because by reducing volume of the resonator, you also reduce the size of the region where you have to inject free carriers in order to achieve modulation. And by doing that, you actually reduce the energy consumption of the modulator. So kind of keeping the optimal uh, uh, trade-off between the Q factor and the mode volume. And a lot of people actually use these I mean, uh, resonator modulators in modern systems. I mean, you can actually play with the diameter. You can play with the volume. Reducing the, the volume and reducing the sizes would essentially bring you to the regime where um, you can actually reduce energy consumption. So that's a uh, uh, modulator. Um, any questions on this? Okay, if not, we can actually move on to other types of whispering gallery resonators, um, ultra high Q resonators, such as microspheres and micro toroids. And these are basically the same category of resonators that also combine light by total internal reflection, but they're ultra high Q because they're produced by different fabrication processes. Uh, that lead to very smooth surfaces, right? And uh, you will see in a moment how they're produced. It's not just simple semiconductor etching that we have here that always results with some surface roughness. Instead, they're based on silica uh, typically, and uh, they're produced by melting of the material and letting it re uh, um, cool down and form these spherical or toroidal shapes. And these resonators have been used to demonstrate the highest Q factor so far, uh, kind of 10 to 10 range. Uh, but as you see here, they have very, very large mode volumes. So they would not be really used for applications where you care about having a small mode volume. But in nonlinear optics applications that we'll uh, address later on today, they're um, actually very often favorable uh, for reducing thresholds of nonlinear optical processes because a lot of these processes depend on Q factor squared to mode volume. So increasing Q factor helps you more than reducing mode volume. And also they, they've been used quite a lot in uh, biosensing applications for experiments that people have sensed a single molecule uh, attached to a surface and so on. And again, that's a result of this ultra high Q, Q factor. Uh, so going to uh, microsphere resonators, we'll first talk about microspheres and then microtoroids, which historically kind of were introduced afterwards and were new uh, generation sort of, of microsphere resonators, but modes are pretty much the same. Uh, microsphere resonators were proposed by uh, Braginsky and collaborators uh, by people who were actually interested in looking into cavity quantum electrodynamics effects and also who worked on LIGO um, uh, in 1980s um, and they were not really proposed for practical applications. People just wanted to make ultra high Q uh, small size resonator that would recirculate field a lot. Uh, but then they ended up being kind of workhorse uh, resonators for also non-linear optics experiments. And um, of course, you make this sphere of materials, so you have to support it with something. And this picture from Kerry Bahal's group at Caltech kind of shows you how typically people will do experiments. There is a support post. This is a microsphere. You launch the field in a particular mode. I mean, this is kind of frequency converted field. Uh, third harmonic from 1550 pump, so it's in the green, and in the back you see fiber taper that's used to couple in and out of the resonator. Um, 
so how people how do people um, analyze these resonators? I mean, they're produced by melting. Um, before we go there, uh, what people would do is they would take fiber, melt it with um, a torch, um, just with a flame or carbon dioxide laser, uh, that uh, is uh, can can lead to precise melting of silica, and then it's a little bit of kind of black magic in the process because you have to precisely control the process so that after you melt glass, it forms this spherical shape. And if you look at the early papers, people had a lot of uh, difficulty controlling the process to obtain sphere. So they would produce something that's more spheroidal uh, and it would kind of have some different modes and sometimes exhibit chaotic behavior for the modes. Uh, but then people learned the art of making this and um, and uh, eventually produce very, very nice uh, resonators. Of course, they would produce a lot of resonators and then post select the ones that are mostly spherical. Um, so the field uh, inside of this structure um, also is confined by total internal reflection. It's just simply a total internal reflection. I mean, at the interface between this glass sphere and surrounding air. Um, so you have refractive index of 1.5 surrounding by, by air. These are solid spheres. I mean, they have a core also. It's a solid sphere of glass. Uh, but the modes are whispering gallery modes, right? And it's a three-dimensional geometry. It's not anymore two-dimensional disk like the one that we analyzed last time. So you would have to solve the field differently. Um, but you basically just have to solve wave equation, uh, electromagnetic wave equation in a spherical geometry. So it's essentially the same as a problem of particle in a central potential in quantum mechanics, like hydrogen atom, where you have Schrodinger equation uh, and you have central uh, uh, potential, uh, central symmetric potential, um, like com potential coming from the core uh, centered uh, at the center of, of the atom. Here is the same story. You have wave equation in spherical geometry and your uh, Kind of confinement comes from the spherical surface and boundary conditions are, are determined by that spherical surface. So when you look at the solutions of, for electromagnetic field inside of these spherical resonators, it would actually look very similar to solutions for a wave function for a particle in a central potential, like hydrogen, um, hydrogen atom wave functions. And there will be three numbers that we'll introduce in order to explain uh, distribution of electromagnetic field. I will not really derive it here. I will just show you the final solutions and explain how, how they look like. But there'll be three numbers, the same as three numbers defining wave functions for uh, a hydrogen atom. Uh, and we um, refer to them as P. Uh, P is the principal quantum number. And that's equivalent of the um, principal quantum number for hydrogen atom, which would tell you in which orbit basically you, you excite electron, right? What's the energy of the electron? Um, and then you also have angular momentum quantum numbers or equivalent of angular momentum quantum numbers that are here labeled as L and M. And that de defines the, the shape of the field and the number of the orbit, right? So, so P, if you compare it to whispering gallery modes of a micro disk, would also define the number of nodes and anti-nodes inside of the sphere in the radial direction, right? So for the smallest mode volume, we would prefer to work in P equal to one modes, same as the reason why we prefer to work in N equal to one modes for micro disk. So you have only one ring of the field. And then L and M would tell you the shape of the field and the number of the orbits. And now because you have spherical geometry, even if you have P equal to one, meaning just one lobe as you go in the radial direction, you can excite multiple rings of the field um, around the equator of the sphere, right? And um, if you would like to have only a single ring of the field at the surface of the sphere, then you need modes that have L equal to M. And in that case, you basically just have a single equatorial orbit and a single ring of the field around the equator, as I'll, I'll show you in a moment. So the, the uh, components of the electric field, I mean, you can kind of group modes into the two different categories, you, uh, which we refer to as TM type or electric type and T type or metric type. It doesn't matter, these are details. You can read it in the course reader. Uh, people prefer to work with TM type modes that have primary electric field component in the radial direction. Uh, and the reason why those modes are preferable is because it's easier to couple to them from the fiber taper from the outside. And for those modes, um, this is how the electric field distribution would look like. Uh, this is field inside of the sphere. This is field outside of the sphere. 
Um, and these different numbers, I mean, you see also these uh, quantum numbers here taking place. Uh, these are Legendre polynomials. Uh, so basically Legendre polynomial multiplied by angular field distribution. Um, you've seen this also in spherical harmonics when you solved hydrogen atom, if you've had quantum mechanics classes. Um, and these uh, functions here, J and H, are Bessel and sphere, um, spherical Bessel and spherical Henkel functions that are actually defined as follows relative to the Bessel and, and Henkel functions. So this is just a regular Bessel function. This is a regular Henkel function, which is a superposition of the Bessel function of first kind and second kind. And anyway, these are all special functions. It doesn't matter. You, you just have the, the expression and you can plug it in and plot the field if you're interested. Um, but the bottom line is that these electric field distributions, not surprisingly, look very similar to solutions for the wave function of a hydrogen atom uh, because uh, you're solving wave equation in uh, spherical geometry and your boundary conditions are given by the spherical surface of the sphere. And this is very similar to the problem of electron in hydrogen or particle in a spherical potential as in a central potential where you just solve Schrodinger equation in the same geometry. And that's why you see basically these uh, uh, spherical harmonics. Um, you have Legendre polynomials and you have this angular distribution taking place. Um, I already said that people prefer to work with P equal to one, which would have only one lobe of the field in the radial direction. That's sort of like N equal to one mode. So you can excite them from the outside. And also L equal to M, which means that you have only one ring of the field. So an example, um, P equal to one, L equal to M equal to 50. If you just simply take uh, the expressions that I wrote previously and you plot the field in MATLAB, um, this is what you would see. Right. So there is a single equatorial orbit. Um, if you go in radial direction, you would see something like this for the field. And since here, here we're talking about TM-like or electric type modes that have dominant electric field component in the radial direction, then uh, there will be discontinuity for that radial component because um, you have to preserve displacement factor, right? So refractive index inside of the sphere times electric field is the same as refractive index outside of the sphere times radial component of the field. That's why you see discontinuity at the sphere boundary because this is all for that radial component, which is dominant. But you see also that you have a nice tail of the field. Uh, so sphere boundary would be here and sort of like n equal to one modes uh, of micro disk, you would just have one lobe of the field next to the surface. And then L equal to M basically excites only one ring of the field. And that's what you also see in the experiment here. If you didn't have L equal to M, then you can excite some modes that have multiple rings. For example, one down and one up, up above the equator in addition to this. But that would not be as preferable because mode volume increases. So this one kind of when you look at it here, it sort of looks like um, N equal to one, M equal to 50 mode of a micro disk. So if you travel around the equator, you will see basically two times 50 or 100 zeros of the field. Okay, and blue and red denote here negative and positive uh, maxima of the field. Okay, so that's a microsphere. Um, I mean, you can use these expressions to plot the field of the microsphere. So now um, uh, just few comments uh, on the Q factor. And actually, I should also emphasize again that everything I tell you here for a microsphere also holds for microtoroid, right? Um, because they're pretty much the same geometry. And when we talk about microtoroid, you will see how they're connected. So everything that I say about the Q factor or field distribution, you can also use to, to analyze microtoroids. So the Q factor uh, of this system as Q factor for any resonator would be limited by combination of radiative losses and material absorption losses. So radiative losses is the same thing that we analyzed for microdisc, is purely result of the fact that total internal reflection doesn't confine light perfectly, right? Uh, and material absorption, uh, material related losses would come from several com contributions. It could be uh, resulting from surface inhomogeneity, so, so something like surface roughness that would scatter the field. It could result from absorption in the water layer that's absorbed at the surface, and also bulk absorption, absorption in glass, which we know uh, in silica is, is always present. That's why people operate in, at 1550 wavelengths in optical fibers. Uh, this water absorption in water layer absorbed at the surface 
it would of course you know uh, be an issue in all types of resonators but we don't care about it in normal resonators because we generally don't operate in the ultra high q regime if you get to ultra high q regime then effects like this will start to matter but normally you know if you operate with smaller q factors this is not or if your resonator is encapsulated with different material i mean if you put oxide on top of silicon or something then you wouldn't care about this absorption in water layer okay so then going back to combination i mean your q factor is always smaller than smaller of the two right uh, so smaller of these two radiative or material loss would give you the limit on the q factor okay and this of course comes from the fact that you uh, lost power loss is inversely proportional to q factor and when you are adding up losses you are adding up uh, powers and those powers are inversely proportional to q factors corresponding to particular contributions any questions here okay so now going back to, to kind of different contributions to the Q factor, radiative Q factor. Um, analysis of this would be very similar to analysis of radiative Q factor that we had for microdisc resonator. Um, and you can actually look at the, the limit on the radiative Q factor coming from the fact that your field, you know, is not perfectly confined and has to leak at each bounce from the surface. And same as what we concluded for um, microdisc resonator, this Q factor would increase if you operate in a mode that has a larger azimuthal number. So for example, if you uh, plot the radiative Q factor for a sphere, a silica sphere, you fix operating wavelength and you fix operation into P equal to one, L equal to M mode. So that's basically just a single equatorial orbit, but you increase sphere radius, right? Which means that of course, as you are going to larger and larger radii, but you are fixing the operating wavelength, then your L and M, which are equal, have to increase, okay? So as you are operating in a mode that has larger and larger M, same as for a microdisc resonator, your radiative Q would, would uh, increase because you essentially operate in the regime, I mean, your, your microsphere is very large relative to your operating wavelength, so you're confined better and better using total internal reflection. Um, so Q increases exponentially as a function of sphere radius, and this was taken from the reference by Buck and Kimball that's um, cited inside of the lecture notes. The choice of wavelength here comes from the fact that they were interested in using this for atomic physics, so this is a transition in cesium, um, wavelength corresponding to transition in cesium. But anyway, you can actually see here the Q factor increases dramatically, and you know, for spheres of only 10 to 15 micro radii, your Q, radiative Q would be 10 to 15 or more, right? And we remember that state of the art Q factors here are around 10 to 10 and spheres are much larger. So, you know, uh, assuming you make sufficiently large sphere, this is not gonna matter. It will matter uh, if you go to small sphere radii, you know, clearly also from the previous picture, if you go to sphere radius of five microns or so, your Q is only 10,000, right? Um, and what is even more important to emphasize here is that if you plot the mode volume also for these same modes as a function of the sphere radius, you see that even for the minimal mode volume, uh, you will, which is on the order of a you know, few dozens of cubic optical wavelengths, um, it's already pretty large, much bigger than, for example, mode volumes of uh, photonic crystal resonators and so on. And for this minimum value of the mode volume factor is only 10,000. So why am I emphasizing this? I'm emphasizing this because this is not a good choice of resonator if you really want small mode volume, right? It is a good choice of resonator if you want a very high Q factor, but not very small mode volume because the best that you can do is, you know, something like 20 or 30 cubic optical valence and Q factor is 10,000. And you can do way better in photonic crystals. But it's a really good resonator if you don't care that much about very large mode volume, but you care about having ultra high Q factor. So that's a radiative part of the Q factor. Uh, okay. The other materials uh, losses uh, were decomposed into three contributions. Uh, one was bulk absorption. So bulk absorption is simply absorption in silica. Um, and you can easily derive this expression just by looking into uh, absorption loss of something propagating through silica, which would be e to the minus alpha z, right? And alpha is the absorption coefficient. And then looking also into the decay of the field for that particular whispering gallery mode, which is e to the minus omega t over q, 
and time is distance divided by uh, distance divided by speed of light. Actually, we'll do that later today when we're analyzing nonlinear resonators. So, so by really, yeah, uh, go on, please. Um, could you explain again why the uh, yeah yeah so has a, have, why the sphere has a large mode volume? Why does it have large mode volume? Okay, so if you are thinking about the total internal reflection as you go to actually, I mean, this plot explains it very well. If you go to very small uh, uh, sizes of resonators, uh, you start to confine your field more and more inside of the small region, right? And that means that if you look at the components of your field in uh, Fourier domain, there will be a lot of, since it's localized very tightly in real space, in frequency space, there will be a lot of kind of plane wave components that contribute to the field, a lot of k-vector components. Okay, so the tighter you confine it in real space, the more of a spread you have in k-space. And the more of a spread you have in k-space, the harder and harder it is to confine it by total internal reflection. And this is why it eventually blows up because you can't even confine it. Uh, but as you are reducing the radius, you know, you're kind of increasing the spread of k-components and that's why the q-factor is dropping. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's why you have to use actually distributed Bragg reflection in order to confine field into small volumes. So now going back to bulk absorption, right, as we said, by equating propagation loss, assuming the field is completely confined in silica and lo looking at the absorption coefficient, um, of, which is just in units of, of inverse length, right, and equating that by uh, decay describes, energy decay described with the particular Q factor, you can find that this Q factor is just 2 pi n, n is refractive index divided by alpha, absorption coefficient of the material, silica, and lambda operating wavelength. And um, if you plot that, um, of course, it would depend on absorption coefficient of silica, uh, which is wavelength dependent, you will obtain something that looks like this, okay? So why do you think there is a peak here at 1550? Where does that come from for Q factor? this Q factor. It comes from minimum of absorption in silica, right? That's exactly the reason why we use uh, 1550 as a wavelength for optical communications using fibers, because that's minimum of the absorption in, in silica, in glass. And there is another minimum around 1300, but not as good as the one at 1500. So it, the, this optimal wavelength, um, and um, you know this is just bulk absorption, which is kind of the same for any any mode inside of the sphere. Um, the Q factors would be limited to you see to values that are on the order of 10 to 11 at the optimal wavelength. But if you're at 900 nanometers, it's some something on the order of 10 to 10, right? Q times 10 to 10. So this is already below the radiative Q factors that we were mentioning on the previous slide, right? So so that's telling you that even if you make your sphere with very large radius when what kind of radiative loss would be limited to Q factors of 10 to 20 or, or even larger. I mean, absorption loss will limit Qs, uh, clamp Qs at something on the order of 10 to 11, okay? And you can't really expect to see much higher Q factors than Q times 10 to 11. And people are already very close to that. And then another uh, factor that often kind of comes up in these experiments is absorption in the water layer adsorbed at the surface. Again, this doesn't matter in normal circumstances, but it matters if you have ultra high Q resonators. Uh, what is happening is that, you know, you make your resonator, you put it in like, uh, the, unless it's in vacuum, you, you put it in normal environment, there is kind of water adsorption, water layer that forms at the surface. Water has absorption. Uh, inside of it, and that would impact the Q factor. And in this uh, paper um, that's uh, cited inside, of course, a course reader, you can see that as you bake out your sphere, uh, your Q factor would increase. So this here is basically photon storage time or cavity ring down time. Uh, so you see here that as you make the sphere and you measure Q factor, Q factor would drop and level off after about 10 to 20 minutes because you form this water layer and uh, that would eventually limit the absorption, and you know there is not there are no changes beyond beyond that point. But then, if you bake it um, at 400 degrees Celsius after about 20 minutes, uh, you uh, evaporate that water layer, so your Q jumps, 
so solution for this is that you keep your sphere inside the vacuum or you have to uh, bake it off uh, occasionally or you cap it with some other material if you if you can produce some sort of cladding and excite modes inside and as a proof that this is something from uh, coming from kind of changes or absorption of something at the surface uh, you can also see a red shift in the wavelength of your modes as a function of time as this water layer is forming because you're technically increasing by a little bit the radius of the sphere which means that all of these modes are red shifting in valent a little bit and that's that's plotted here uh, so this can limit q factor a lot but there is a solution for that right you can actually bake it off or you put it in vacuum and that way you solve the problem uh, and that's what people did in the high skew factor uh, experiments and the final contribution to the material skews was this scattering uh, coming from surface inhomogeneities um, and the high skew factors measured in these systems were always limited by surface inhomogeneities um, because people that was no matter how well you make this and this is an AFM image of the surface um, uh, area you see that there is a little bit of roughness and that little bit of roughness would affect uh, uh, on the on the scale of about five nanometers that would affect scattering and um, cause additional basically scattering radiative loss that would limit the Q factor. So this becomes more critical as you uh, move towards smaller diameters of the spheres because it's kind of larger fraction relative to the diameter of the sphere. Uh, but um, in this experiment, actually, they measure actually Q factors for the system uh, as a function of the sphere diameters. And the highest Qs that were measured were around 10 to 10, and that's the record value that was measured. But they also noticed that all the values of Qs, total Qs that were measured, kind of lined up on this curve. And this curve is just scattering by surface inhomogeneities. Uh, and plot it for inhomogeneities that they measured using AFM. So that's basically state of the art in terms of cues. And um, as I'll mention in a moment, people are now primarily working on microtoroids instead of microspheres, but the same type of limitations would apply to microtoroids. And these surface inhomogeneities would again clamp Q at a particular value. So when you combine everything, you know, uh, radiative loss and material loss, of course, the smaller of the two would always limit the Q factor. So if you plot radiative loss and material loss for P equal to one, L equal to M modes, fixed at wavelength of 852 nanometers, radiative loss curve would look like dashed curve, material loss contribution of all three effects would look like dotted curve. Uh, the smaller of the two would always limit the total Q. So for radii, below about eight microns, you will have radiative loss dominate. And for radii greater than eight microns, you will have materials loss dominate, one of the components in the materials loss. And for the ones where the highest Q factors were measured, those were spheres with very, very large radii. I mean, they were uh, on the order of tens or hundreds of microns, as, sorry, as you saw from, from these plots. Okay, so there's diameter of a few hundreds of microns. And in that regime, radiative loss is not limiting, certainly. Uh, they were in vacuum, so there was no issue with water absorption. Uh, absorption loss was also not limiting the operation. It was basically limited just by surface scattering because of uh, imperfections. So despite the fact you know, that you use melting of glass and uh, um, that you are not really using etching and any mask to form this, there is always some surface homogeneities on the order of nanometers that would eventually matter. What's so, yeah, sure. What's a usual experimental method to measure Q? So for, um, depending on what system you're measuring uh, Q in, right? So if you are, have an active material, you can look at photoluminescence, you can look at transmission, you know, that what we talked about in terms of modulators and, uh, um, you know, you tune your laser and then look at the transmission and look at the transmission dip. dip. But when you go to ultra high Q resonators like this, then you basically don't have enough resolution in your tunable laser um, or in your spectrometer because it, you can actually measure Q either by exciting with broadband source and looking on a spectrometer or you, tune, you do fine tuning of your laser and you have a detector at the output and you look at the minimum of transmission. But if you go to Qs of 10 to 10, then you may not have enough uh, 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 spectral resolution in your tunable laser, which is why people do cavity ring down measurements. Uh, and cavity ring down measurement is basically what is plotted here. Um, 
uh, I mean, this is not what's plotted here, but that's the time scale that they measure from ring down, meaning that they uh, excite a field inside of the resonator, right? And then um, they look at the output port and they look how field decay in time. And you know that energy stored in the resonator decays as e to the minus omega t over q. So by, by sampling this at different instance of time, you can actually uh, look at how energy in your system decays. So basically, when you are operating in high Q to low Q regime, you can do just measurements in spectral domain from kind of Fourier transform of the cavity resonance, and you just measure line bit. But if you go to ultra high Q regime, it's better, it's easier to do measurements in time domain, and that's called cavity ring down measurement. Okay. Does that clarify? Yeah, yeah. thanks. Okay, good. So now, um, you know, with these microspheres, I mean, they're pretty complicated uh, resonators, right? It's a spherical geometry, you know, you have three quantum numbers, you can excite multiple orbits. I mean, we like to work with P equal to one, L equal to M modes, but in reality, there are all these different combinations of quantum numbers that you can have and multiple orbits. So when you are looking at the um, uh, spectrum of this uh, sphere, you will see a mass of modes. And uh, a free spectral range would be small. Uh, what is a free spectral range? Free spectral range is the distance between different resonances. So for the highest Q factor as that people measured that are kind of around 10 to 10, those were very, very large spheres. I mean, the larger the spheres, the smaller the free spectral range, as you know. So that their free spectral range was about 0.3 nanometers. So next mode was only 0.3 nanometers away. And of course, it's an ultra high Q mode, so line width is much smaller. But then, you know, you are operating somewhere where modes are separated by a very small amount. And that's not good because, you know, if you put something like an atom or a quantum dot or a molecule, it would couple to multiple modes. Uh, people generally want to operate to work with a cleaner system where separation of modes is, is much larger, uh, increased free spectral range. And to do that, I mean, you can kind of um, do similar things as what people did with micro rings relative to micro disks, which means remove inner part, right? I mean, if you can make a hollow sphere that would solve part of the problem because at least you would have a P equal to one modes only, but you wouldn't eliminate multiple orbits, uh, modes that are excited for different L and M. And also that's technologically really hard. I mean, it's hard to make a sphere anyway. So, so that is not a solution, but you can actually do something different. I mean, I, if you look at the micro disks that we discussed before or micro rings, the good thing is they're on chip. You know, you can make arrays of them. You don't really need to support them with anything, any holders. Um, you can actually put waveguides here to couple in and out. You don't need fiber tapers. But the problem with these micro disks was that Q factors were severely degraded by surface roughness. And that was produced by microfabrication because you put a mask and that mask degrades and then there is a roughness, so that limits the Q. And then we had these microspheres that had really nice Q factors. They're ultra high Q factors. They had very small surface roughness. They were the highest Q factor resonators, but then they had difficult handling. You have to literally hold them with some, some uh, stages and support posts and then bring fiber in. So there is no possibility of integration. So the idea uh, that people had was how you could kind of get the best, take the best of both geometries, um, make ultra high Q resonators on chip, something that would be kind of microsphere, but in an integrated on chip geometry. And that is exactly what people did with microtoroids. Uh, microtoroids are essentially looking like toroids. They're made out of glass, but they're attached to a chip. In early experiments, people have used fiber tapers to couple to them in and out, but there were some more recent experiments with ultra high Q resonators and waveguides. Again, they're attached to the chip. Handling is much easier, but they reach the same range of Q factors as microspheres, uh, which is why um, since the um, introduction of microtoroids, pretty much all of the community uh, working on these types of resonators has moved to microtoroids from microspheres. All of the conclusions are for microspheres, for modes of the microsphere, for limits on Q factors still hold, except that here, when you have a microtoroid geometry, you only can excite P equal to one, L equal to M modes. So it's just a single equatorial orbit, but Q factor would be limited in the same way. So how do you make something like this? Um, the first part of the process is the same as fabrication of micro disks that we discussed before. Uh, 
uh, but the material is different. You start from silica or silicon, you do some uh, deposit a mask, use that to etch a disc of silica, uh, remove water resist, then do undercutting. Uh, and here pedestal is based on uh, silicon, so you would do undercutting in xenon difluoride. Uh, which is a dry etcher. Uh, I mean, you have xenon dichloride etcher also in SNF. So it's not a wet etch step, but you end up with a, a ring, I'm sorry, disc of silica sitting on silicon pedestal. And at this point, it would just be a simple micro disc made of silica, but then uh, it would also have a lot of surface roughness and other issues. But then actually from in the last step, uh, people take CO2 laser, which melts silica, and then use that to melt this silica disc and uh, uh, let it kind of uh, cool down and form the toroid uh, as a result of surface tension. And that smoothens up the surface and produces this toroidal shape. So there is still some art in the process, but much less than with microsphere fabrication because ultimately geometry of this is limited really by the geometry of the disk that you fabricate by uh, traditional microfabrication techniques. And this step has to be timed precisely, but it's much easier to do that than make microspheres. Why so here is, etching? yeah, please. Why the dry etching will only etch the bottom and the base of the SiO2? Xenon this is xenon dichloride, right? So you do use dry etching to transfer first from this mask to the disc, right? So you use some sort of also fluoride etching, but directional etch. And then you change uh, xenon dichloride etcher is just uh, uh, isotropic etcher for silicon. Uh, so it's a, a xenon dichloride plasma would etch silicon equally in all directions, but it would not attack uh, silicon dioxide significantly. So what happens is once you kind of etch silica, silicon dioxide, and you put this in xenon difluoride, it will start eating away all silicon around this. Uh, and you have to do it in a timed way, right? You have to take it out before it eats the whole pedestal. So you have to time that step. The same thing that you would have to do with wet etch. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, so it is a timed step. Okay. So here you can actually see the difference. So this is micro disc that you fabricate basically after this step, silica micro disc. This is how it looks like. You see some surface roughness. What, this is electron beam, um, scanning electron microscope image. So what you see here at the center is a pedestal. Uh, I mean, you see it through silica layer, right? Uh, and then here, after the CO2 illumination, you see that it's much smoother and you form the toroid and toroid has 120 micron diameter and seven, seven micron thick. And here you can excite uh, P equal to one, L equal to M mode, right? And this here uh, underneath is silicon pedestal. So when you measure um, transmission through this, again, by tuning your laser, um, I mean, depends what laser you have. In this case, you can't precisely resolve the Q factor, but you see resonances where resonances are. Uh, and this was for the early work. Um, later on, people had higher Q factors. Uh, here uh, for cues of 10 to 8, you scan the laser, you look at the transmission down the fiber taper, and you see uh, drops when you hit resonances. And these would be resonances of microtoroid, the same as with micro ring or micro disc. And the free spectral range um, is almost 6 nanometers, so much larger than 0.3 nanometers that you would have for a sphere of comparable diameter. So you have much larger separation between modes, which is better for experiments. You will not operate in multi-mode regime. And actually these tiny um, uh, dips that you have here are kind of leftover modes with larger P uh, numbers uh, that would have relatively low Q uh, because after melting, there is still some, some kind of re residual layer of silica uh, sitting in the toroid where you can excite some, some weakly confined uh, modes with larger P. And that's what they're seeing here, but you know, they're not really you know, important for the transmission. So this already tells you that it's much, much better to, to work uh, with toroids than microspheres. It's easier to handle them. You're reaching the same range of Q factors. It's limited in the same way. And uh, that's also the reason why you will not really see much work on microspheres in the past 10 to 15 years. It's mostly on micro toroids. So that's a uh, micro toroid. And now we will uh, make a brief break, like five minute break. And after that, I will uh, tell you a little bit about how these systems can be used to 
uh, improve nonlinear optical devices. And although we will have a discussion specifically related to microspheres and microtoroid systems, because it's easy to derive threshold for one specific nonlinear optical process for those systems, this discussion is more general. I mean, resonators can help you reduce threshold for a variety of nonlinear optical processes. So we will only look at it for one nonlinear optical process, which is Raman lasing uh, and Raman scattering. Uh, but you can likewise derive uh, the same thing for other nonlinear optical processes and other uh, resonator geometries. Okay, so let's make a brief break and then resume. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions. You're uh, welcome. Yeah, you question. So previously, um, you say that when we confine the modes even more in the sphere um, resonator, then you have more K uh, spectrum. Yeah. So harder to confine. Yeah. Actually, it's like a little bit contradictory to me because you try to confine the uh, mode. Um, so it should give you a smaller mode volume. Yeah, yeah, it gives you smaller mode volume, but if you think about it, uh, I mean, when we derive total internal reflection, we, we found out that total internal reflection works per perfectly for planar interface and one specific K vector, right? It's all in the geometrical optics picture. It's kind of plane wave, right, in from the input. So when you think about some mode that is confined in a small region of space, you can't think of it as a plane wave, right? Let's think about just like Gaussian envelope. Gaussian is a function of X, right? That's not a plane wave. In fact, you can use just Fourier transform and by Fourier transform, you can decompose it into plane waves. And uh, uh, if you take Gaussian in real space, it will be also Gaussian in K space. Distribution of plane waves would also follow Gaussian in K space. And the narrower the Gaussian in real space, the broader it would be in K space and vice versa. Because just, just simply looking from Fourier transforms or, I mean, if you think about it, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is basically just the same, it's the same story because momentum space is uh, kind of Fourier space for real space. So, so the something, if something is narrower in real space, then it's wider in the K space, in the momentum space. Does that make sense? So if you think about this, what is the, ultimate limit of confinement in real space, Dirac delta function, right? Yeah. So how would that look like in K space? Flat, right? You need all Ks in order to build up Dirac delta function, right? The yeah. other extreme would be something that's just one single K point in K space. What is that? That's a plane wave, right? Yeah. In real space, that's completely unconfined right yeah. and then in between you know as you increase um, uh, spread extent relative to direct delta function in real space you would be decreasing it in k space right so there is a really uncertainty principle there is the spread in real space and, and k space are inversely proportional to each other so as you start confining your resonant mode into a smaller and smaller volume resonator right you're confining it more and more in real space, which means that you need larger and larger spread in K space. Right? Yeah. Meaning more and more plane waves. And more and more plane waves means harder and harder to confine it by total internal reflection. Okay, so there's an optimum region. Uh, well, uh, no, the, the optimum region optimum region is a single K vector component, which means you go to infinity, right? Basically in real space, completely unconfined, single plane wave. That's the optimum. That's where you can have infinite, if you're thinking about transmission to a second medium for planar interface, single K vector would be the best. But, you know, of course, if you are thinking about resonators, the larger, the larger the resonator, you know, assuming it's only confined by total internal reflection, the larger the resonator, uh, the smaller the spread in K space, which means it's easier, it's easier to confine it at a single interface. So that's why we see increase, exponential increase in radiative Q as you uh, go to higher M modes, because you're approaching kind of ray picture mid in a limit and yeah. resonator gets bigger and bigger relative to wavelength. Mm -hmm. 
But you know, this is only the story that holds for total internal reflection. When we talk about distributed Bragg reflection on, on Thursday, you will see that, I mean, of course, you have to still think about the modes whenever you have total internal reflection, you have to think about Fourier components and how they're confined, but you know, you, there is a distributed Bragg reflection. So it's not exactly the same story. You can kind of confine it in the direction where you have distributed Bragg reflection much more tightly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So in the distributed Bragg refractor in 2D yeah. crystal. Yeah. And we always wanted to confine it to smaller and smaller space. Yeah. Um in this in this case you say that's because we have more k space spectrum. Yeah, but we will discuss on Thursday. I mean, you cannot confine it uh as much as you like, because remember that in 2D photonic crystals in the vertical direction, you still have total internal reflection. So the more you squeeze it in real space, again, you are spreading it more in k-space and you will be crossing the light line and losing confinement in the vertical direction. But it's right. only one direction. And that's exactly the, the approach or the, the mechanism that people have in head when uh, in their um, uh, in, in their heads when they're trying to design better photonic crystal resonators, right? How do you kind of still have small mode volume, but find a trade-off so that you are not crossing the light line as much? So that trade-off that you're talking about does exist there. But for total internal reflection, when it's total internal reflection in all dimensions, really there is no trade-off because if you keep decreasing the volume, you are spreading it more and more and you're simply just losing more and more light. Right. Okay, so I, I think we've, uh, five minutes have passed, we can actually move on to this, right? So I'll, I'd like to spend the last 20 minutes or so just telling you about nonlinear optics applications of resonators with focus on one specific nonlinear optics application. And, you know, this is just a brief introduction. Of course, you can think of this uh, in the context of other nonlinear optical processes. This is not a nonlinear optics class, so I'll just very briefly introduce what nonlinear optics means, and then we'll see what happens when you look at nonlinear uh, optics inside of resonators. Um, and everything that we've done so far is basically linear optics, where you have some uh, displacement vector, which is linearly proportional to electric field with some refractive index, or in other words, you have your displacement vector being equal epsilon naught E plus P, where P is polarization and material polarization is proportional to susceptibility of the material, which is uh, uh, multiplied by electric field. And this susceptibility is constant, right? So that's a linear optical material. But if this susceptibility is not constant, if it depends on the field, you know, you can actually, or, or it's just simply not constant, it can actually depend on, on a variety of other things, then you will have nonlinear optical effects. And there are a variety of nonlinear optical effects, um, second, third harmonic generation, and so on. We will not really analyze them here. We will just focus on the Raman scattering. But you can easily see that, you know, if chi, for example, depends on the field, then epsilon depends on the field, and then you will have some, some terms that depend on square or third uh, um, order, third power of electric field, and that's very different from linear optical regime. So you can have some changes in the color of light. You know, you pump it with one color, you see the other color at the output. Same as for microsphere that I showed you before. People pumped with 1550, uh, but silica uh, is material that has third order nonlinearity, with, which means that you can actually produce third harmonic of the input uh, field uh, at the output. So at the output, you, what people used to image the mode of the sphere was third harmonic, um, uh, which is in green. It's around 500 nanometers. So, so that's in general nonlinear optics. And one specific uh, uh, nonlinear optical effect that we'll look into today is Raman, Raman scattering and Raman lasing. Uh, Raman scattering is just a non-inelastic uh, scattering from, from the material um, in, that's illustrated here. Uh, let's say you pump material with laser frequency, um, omega L. You can inelastically scatter it into what we call Stokes photon and vibrational quantum. So that's a phonon, quantum of vibration. Um, and this here dashed line is not an actual um, excited state of the system. This is just a virtual level. So, you know, I mean, you just inelastically scatter laser photon into Stokes photon and vibrational quantum. 
And what frequency you get at the output depends on what bands of phonon bands or vibrational modes you have in the system. And that signature of that is what would determine frequency of the Stokes photons. So if you pump the system with laser frequency and you look where your Stokes uh, photons are, that would be a signature of the system. And people actually use that for uh, things like Raman spectroscopy, because every uh, molecule has, you know, particular vibrational modes, particular vibrational spectrum. So if you want to make distinguish between uh, some dangerous molecule and something that's completely harmless, although they have the same refractive index, you would do Raman spectroscopy. And the same thing applies to solids. And of course, there is a reverse process where you pump the system at a specific frequency, laser frequency, omega L, but you also absorb vibrational quantum and you produce so-called anti-Stokes photon at a higher frequency, which would have uh, frequency or energy, which is a sum of the laser photon energy and vibrational quantum energy. And of course, this also depends on the spectrum of the vibrational modes in the system, but anti-Stokes scattering process is much less, less likely than Stokes scattering because in this case, you absorb vibrational quanta. So you actually have to have them available in the system to absorb them. So this is less likely than Stokes scattering, but you, 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 both of them will appear when you're doing Raman spectroscopy. Okay. So that's Raman scattering, you know, inelastic scattering uh, in the system. Uh, and if you would like to write Hamiltonian for these processes, that's pretty easy, right? So if you think about Stokes scattering, you are annihilating a laser photon and you are creating Stokes photon and vibrational quantum. So this would be something Hamiltonian for this process would be proportional to annihilation for laser photon AL, creation of Stokes photon, creation of vibrational quantum. And likewise for anti-Stokes, where you annihilate laser photon, annihilate vibrational quantum, generate anti-Stokes photon, okay? Um, there are a few pages here, and I will not really go into details of this. This is uh, taken from your Reeves Quantum Electronics. Um, if you're interested, feel free to read it, but on the next few pages, um, you can see how these Hamiltonians, exactly these Hamiltonians, uh, will occur in a material where you have some polarizability of the material that is not constant, right? And that would happen if you, for example, have some sort of vibration in the system and vibrational molecules, or vi vibrational modes of the system, um, in which case polarizability would not be constant, but would actually change and as a function of certain coordinate and time. And if you solve the problem where you have this polarizability, which is not constant, um, which is done in the next few pages, that will actually lead to these extra terms in the Hamiltonian that are exactly like the terms that we wrote already from the physics of the process. So this is, uh, again, extra. It's not something that you need to know for the purposes of this class. You probably would do it in nonlinear optics or, or quantum electronics classes. But this kind of gives you the missing link. Why, how are these processes allowed? Why, you know, if you have a molecule and that molecule vibrates, why would that produce inelastic scattering in the system? So that's uh, just going back to, to uh, kind of derivation of the Hamiltonians, but since we already uh, introduced them from the physics of the problem, we'll just use the expressions that we have here for Stokes and anti-Stokes processes and use that to see what's happening in the system. Uh, so Stokes process, Stokes process, you annihilate, uh, annihilate laser photon, you generate Stokes and vibrational quantum, I wrote here inverse Stokes. Inverse Stokes is also anti-Stokes process, but I don't call it anti-Stokes because I wanted to specifically show the process where you are uh, absorbing back Stokes photons and vibrational quanta and generating photons at a laser frequency because this is really opposite to the process on the left side. What we typically refer to as anti-Stokes is a process where you absorb laser photon and vibrational quantum and you produce something with a frequency of omega L plus omega V. So it's uh, larger than the laser frequency. Uh, and that of course happens in the system, but we're not interested in that. We're interested in the process where you do Raman scattering and generate Stokes photons. But then the opposite process, which I call inverse Stokes is also allowed where you would absorb back Stokes photons and vibrational quanta and generate back laser photons. So you're kind of canceling out Stokes photons that you generated. And that's described with uh, uh, also the expression that's given here. Right? Okay, so, so how do we find the rate uh, of these processes? Um, you can uh, just calculate the rates using something similar to Fermi's golden rule. 
you know Hamiltonian of the process. And for the Stokes term, for example, the Hamiltonian would be proportional to this times some constant terms. So if you assume that you start from the state when you have uh, NL laser photons, NS Stokes photons, okay, they are all at different frequencies in different modes and zero vibrational quanta, then this process would bring you to the state when you have NL minus one laser photons. You lose one laser photon, but you generate one extra Stokes photon and one vibrational quantum. So that's the initial state, that's the final state. And when you're calculating the rate from Fermi's golden rule, you calculate the matrix element between the final and initial state corresponding to the interaction Hamiltonian, which is this. And then you take magnitude squared of that, and that would give you a rate multiplied by some density of states and so on. So for our process, this is the rate that you would obtain, Stokes emission rate, right? So this is the Hamiltonian initial final state magnitude squared. And that term would be proportional to NL NS plus one, where NL and NS are number of photons in laser and Stokes modes. And there will be, of course, constant terms and coming from density of states and, and constants. So that's for the Stokes, Stokes term. And then we can do the same for the inverse process where you absorb back Stokes photons and vibrational quanta and generate laser photons. Your initial state, let's say, is NL laser photons, NS Stokes photons, one vibrational quantum. This process would bring you back to NL plus one. You generate back one laser photon, you lose one Stokes photon and you lose vibrational quantum. And you do the same thing from Fermi's golden rule, but for this other Hamiltonian. And that would give you that this term depends on NS times NL plus one. And of course, there are other density of optical modes and so on that you have to take into account. So if you were interested in finding the total kind of rate of generation of Stokes photons as a function of time, you would, if that rate would increase as a function of this process, you increase it by Stokes process and you reduce it by anti-Stokes process, inverse Stokes process. So you have to subtract these two results, but you also have to multiply them by constants, which we all labeled as D and some probability of the system being in this initial state and in also in the initial state for this particular process, which we labeled as PVG. I mean, here it was in the ground vibrational state and here has to be in the excited vibrational state because you need phonons and annihilate phonons in order to do inverse Stokes process. So that's the subtraction of these two rates and you can write them here, right? Because these um, W terms are different. They, they come from different Hamiltonians and different states. And when you group everything together, this is the expression that you obtain. So number, changing the number of Stokes photons as a function of time is equal to this. So when you, I mean, perform this inelastic scattering your Stokes photon is, or, or your laser photon, the number of Stokes and laser photons, the sum of the number of laser and Stokes photons is always preserved because you either move laser photons to Stokes photons or vice versa, right? So NL plus NS is constant. And um, yeah, these terms here, the last terms are linear terms in NL and NS. But this first term, which is the product of the two is basically quadratic term. So as you're, increasing the number of photons in the system, this one would grow much faster than the final terms, right? And you can actually neglect these final terms in the regime where number of Stokes photons is large because this one would actually grow much stronger than the final ones. Um, so if you just neglect the last term and write the first term, this is basically the equation that gives you the rate of change of Stokes photons as a function of time, right? So it depends on this D, which is a combination of constants, this PVG minus PVE is the uh, um, uh, difference of the probabilities of the system being in the ground vibrational and excited vibrational state, then product of laser photons and Stokes photons. And here you have NS, number of Stokes photons on both sides, which means that you can actually solve this equation, okay? And you can solve it in time. I mean, of course, it's clear that this is exponential growth in time, right? Uh, but you can also solve it in space if you're, for example, have a bulk material and you shine your laser uh, mode um, through the system, you would be generating these Stokes photons along the way. So you can write that this DNS per DT is basically DNS per DZ times <coughs> DZ per DT, which is the speed of light. I mean, everything is in a bulk material. 
So DNS per dz is just one of divided by speed of light in this material times DNS per dt, which is the expression that we had. And we group everything here other than ns as gamma, which we call Raman gain. Okay, and that Raman gain would be in units of one per meter. Um, I mean, you can show that easily, but it's also obvious from here because ns is number of photons, has no units, and this is derivative relative to space. So this whole thing here where V is the speed of light and these are probabilities, these are constants, and NL is the number of photons, is in units of one per meter. So when you look at this, dNs per dz is gamma times ns. That tells you that number of Stokes photons as you're pumping this material with your laser photons <clears throat> would increase exponentially. You would accumulate them and they would propagate uh, in the direction of propagation. And it would increase uh, exponentially with the uh, constant gamma, right? So the number of Stokes photons increases exponentially. And since number of photons is proportional to intensity, that means also the intensity of the Stokes beam increases exponentially, okay? Uh, typically in literature, you will not see this Raman gain noted, which is in one per meter. And the reason why it's not noted is because from this expression, it's obvious that Raman gain depends on the laser pump intensity. It's basically given by this expression and NL is the number of photons in the laser beam. A number of photons in the laser beam depends on the laser intensity. So if you increase the pump intensity, then Raman gain would also increase. Uh, and for that reason, people introduce Raman gain coefficient, which doesn't depend on the laser intensity. So they take out the intensity of the laser beam and everything else which doesn't depend on the laser intensity is Raman gain coefficient, which is in units of meter per watt. And that's what is noted for all the different materials, right? So gamma is G Raman gain coefficient times the laser intensity. And you can write the same solution onto the differential equation here, which tells you that still your Stokes photons would increase exponentially. Uh, but of course there is a loss in material. So they would also decrease exponentially as a function of the absorption in the material, which is given by the absorption coefficient, okay? So if you are interested in finding the threshold for Raman lasing, which means that your increase in the Stokes photons is much, much stronger than uh, loss, how would you find it from these expressions? You have to balance gain and loss, okay? And when you balance gain and loss, that's the threshold. And then after that, if gain is stronger than loss, this exponential increase is much stronger than exponential decrease because these two you have to multiply, right? So they balance each other. And below threshold, loss is much stronger than gain. So when you balance loss and gain, that means that Raman gain coefficient times the intensity of the laser beam is equal to loss or intensity of the laser beam on threshold for Raman lasing is ratio between loss and Raman gain coefficient. And if you plug in typical numbers for silica, because we'll be comparing this to for silica, Raman gain coefficient is given here, uh, absorption coefficient is given here, laser beam intensity, I mean, if you assume that you have um, uh, laser, uh, if from these two expressions, you can find laser beam intensity, which is given here. Uh, so if you assume that your laser pump cross section is 0.1 millimeter squared, then pump power would be intensity times cross section, which is 15 watts. And that's telling you that you need to pump silica with 15 watts in order to see Raman lasing, right? In order to see exponential growth in these inelastically scattered photons. And that's really large power, right? So that's not very practically, practically useful. So how can resonators help us here? I mean, if you look at this expression, it's kind of obvious already what is going on. If you have a resonator, you recirculate the field inside of the resonator, right? So your uh, pump, uh, beam intensity is very different from the intensity that you would have in a single pass. You couple your laser beam and you wrap it around your sphere so you increase the circulating intensity much more, right? Because it's wrapped up many times and that number of times depends on the Q factor. So your laser circulating intensity would be much, much larger than in a single pass through the material, which means that you will balance gain and loss at a much lower pow power of the laser. So how does that work for the microspheres and microtoroids? So in a microsphere or microtoroids, um, uh, your intensity of the beam is power of the beam divided by the cross section. So we'll assume that the cross section of the laser beam in a fiber taper, for example, or waveguide is the same as the cross section of this orbit inside of the resonator. Um, 
And we also know that we have a Q factor for the, um, the modes of the sphere. We will assume that we are pumping the sphere with a laser. Laser is coupled to whispering gallery mode of a sphere, but also Stokes photons would be coupled to another whispering gallery mode of the sphere, right? So your pump is coupled to one mode and your Stokes photons would be coupled to another mode. So for your pump, let's say Q factor is Q and photon storage time is given here. Uh, this is the expression. Um, that will tell you that your pump, because it's wrapped many times around the edge of the sphere, it makes many, many passes that depends on the Q factor of, of that laser mode. It would make the, the trajectory that is much larger than kind of single circumference of, the, of this circle. The, the path, the trajectory that, that the pump would make is roughly proportional to photon storage time for that mode, which is Q factor to divided by frequency times speed of light in silica. Right, and that's proportional to the Q factor. So if you compare this trajectory that laser beam coupled to whispering gallery mode makes with a single pass, would be which would just be two pi times A, where A is the radius of the sphere, it's clear that you have a much, much longer trajectory, which is the ratio of these two, and that increases by a factor that depends on the Q factor. So if your Q factor is 10 to 10, then you kind of wrap up a very, very large number of circles before your beam leaks out. Okay. And that also, that, uh, I'll, I'll take your question, let me just, just uh, show this. That also means that your circulating intensity is much larger because your laser beam that you couple from the outside, which is just power divided by cross section, sort of recirculated many, many times inside of the sphere. And then circulating intensity is coupled intensity times the ratio of the multi-pass length divided by single pass length because that tells you how many times that orbit is wrapped around the sphere and that that's the circulating intensity yes you sure um so um we're always trying to balance the loss with the gain uh -huh. um, uh, in this case we increase the trajectory length yeah yeah then the yeah. load also increase proportionally no because the, this is a different thing there is still absorption loss, but here loss is kind of dominantly radiative. I mean, you're just uh, recirculating your, your field inside of the sphere, right? So if your Q factor is 10 to 10, it doesn't mean that you are, I mean, of course, you are increasing the distance and absorption loss would, uh, would be larger because the length is larger. But remember, absorption loss would limit Q factors to range greater than 10 to 20. <clears throat> so ultimately Q factor loss here would be limited by radiative loss of the whispering gallery mode, right? I mean, you are increasing the interaction length with the material, but the point is that that's not going to hurt you because you are just increasing the number of passes and your Q factor is sufficiently high that you are not getting into the regime where your absorption loss is going to dominate. Yeah, okay? yeah. So, so circulating intensity is given here, right? I, if, if you don't mind, maybe I take a few more minutes to wrap this up. If you need to rush, this will be recorded so you can check it out later, but we only have a few more slides and I wanted to show you now instead of waiting until Thursday. So circulating intensity is given here, right? Uh, and uh, depends on the Q factor. And you can also kind of see that this A, which is cross-sectional area of the field times uh, uh, 2 pi a basically gives you the volume of this equatorial orbit for the mode, right? So 2 pi a times capital A, which is cross-section of the field, is basically volume of this mode. So you can use that and reorganize the denominator, and you see that circulating intensity is proportional to Q factor to mode volume, which is similar to conclusion that we made for Purcell enhancement, but of course it's a very different effect and very different derivation. But in any case, it tells you that you can increase circulating intensity by increasing Q factor to mode volume, okay? So just looking up, uh, let's assume that you have input power of a milliwatt, right? Uh, and then you can build up circulating intensity in a microsphere with the diameter or microtorate with diameter 40 microns with 10 to 8 Q factor, uh, mode volume 500 micrometer cube, very similar to toroid that we looked before. Circulating intensity would be three gigawatts per centimeter squared. Okay, so, so enormous circulating intensity basically coming from field recirculation. So that already tells you how threshold drops down, right? Because now when you're looking at the threshold for Raman lasing, this circulating intensity is what matters. It's not anymore uh, your actual coupled uh, input field intensity, right? So if you look at the uh, Raman lasing threshold, 
you will have to balance your circulating intensity. That's uh, your increase, exponential increase depends on that. This is Raman gain coefficient. And then of course, uh, loss in the system. This is what we were just discussing with you. Sure, depends on a lot of things, but they were all captured by the Q factor of the system. And that would be primarily radi radiative or scattering loss. So this uh, time, again, can be written as distance divided by speed. And distance here is kind of trajectory around the edge of the sphere. Uh, that's what we mean by Z. So when you balance gain and loss, right, because your circulating intensity is much larger than input intensity, when you balance this loss and this gain, you will find out that uh, uh, power of the laser on the threshold, uh, and of course, uh, input, um, input intensity would be that power divided by cross section, but we here directly can express power on threshold <clears throat> would be given here. So it's inversely proportional to Q factor of the laser mode. Uh, Q factor of the Stokes mode, which is also coupled to whispering gallery mode, and volume of your laser mode, right? So it's basically Q factor squared to volume that would reduce this threshold. So if you kind of plug in parameters for the same sphere we discussed before, 40 micron diameter, 10 to 8 Q factor, you assume that you have same Q factor for laser mode and Stokes mode. Uh, if your input power is one milliwatt, that's circulating intensity three gigawatts per centimeter squared, if you already found, as you already found. And then you, you look at the laser threshold from this uh, expression and you obtain 20 microwatts. So enormous reduction relative to 15 watts, right? Um, and that's exactly why people uh, did these Raman lasing experiments inside the ultra high Q resonators because Q factor squared to mode volume helps you. So this is the early work with microspheres. Um, here, uh, Raman lasing threshold was, was pretty small. Um, it was, um, in this case, on the order of 86 microwatts, kind of comparable to what we already found from our analysis um, for 40 micrometer diameter sphere. And here you see after that 86 microwatts threshold, exponential increase in the number of Stokes photons, just this inelastically scattered photons. And again, keep in mind, this is not really electrically driven laser. This is just you pump with one laser, you obtain another kind of stimulated emission at another frequency. And people have demonstrated this also in silicon, right? I mean, first demonstrations in silicon were in large cavities. This is from Intel. Uh, the idea is to use this to regenerate signal, kind of amplify signal at certain frequency. Um, early on, since they had very large volume resonators, relatively low Q factor, uh, threshold for Laman lasing was around 200 milliwatts. Uh, but then in more recent work, and this is from Kyoto Suzumu Noda's group with these ultra high Q resonators in photonic crystal, which have very high Q factor, millions, we'll talk about it Thursday, uh, and very small mode volume, they managed to reduce lasing, lasing threshold in silicon to one microwatt, right? So very much, much smaller than what was demonstrated before. So that's what I wanted to show you, right? So you can achieve dramatic reduction in Raman lasing threshold, but the same holds for other nonlinear optical effects if you use uh, resonators. Okay, are there any questions? If not, we're already over time. So I'll just wrap it up and I'll see you folks on Thursday. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.